I'm Mark Jorgensmeyer, Director of the Orfla Center for Global and International Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara campus. Today we have a wonderful guest to discuss with us the whole field of international and area studies, where it's been, where it's going, how it's changed in an era of globalization. Uh, Ainsley Embry, who for many years was the chair of the history department at Columbia University, was dean of the School of International Affairs. Uh, he's one of the most prominent scholars in the country in the field of South Asian history and South Asian studies in general. He was in the, uh, uh, the embassy, uh, U.S. Embassy in, um, in Delhi during the Carter administration. He's also taught at the School of Foreign Service. And the interesting thing about Ainsley is that his career has in some ways spanned the development of international and area studies in this country. So Ainsley, uh, welcome to Santa Barbara. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to have you here. And what fun it's going to be to talk with you a little bit about yourself, your own career, and how that's interacted with the way international studies and area studies uh, has developed this country. Because I know you're a young man. You certainly look like it. Uh, Thank but you. the rumor is that you started teaching at Columbia in 1958 yes. uh, at a time uh, just after the beginning of the Cold War, right after World War II, when international studies as a field was just coming into being, and area studies focusing on the studies of different parts of the world uh, were just coming into existence as well. I think you had something to do with the creation of the Institute for Southern Asian S Studies at Columbia, but when you came there, did anybody really care about area studies or international studies? Nobody could have cared less, especially about South Asians, Indian studies. Uh, no, it is an interesting point. I had taught for 10 years in India, so I in a way came out of a international background, and also a Canadian. Uh, that is a different country, isn't it? That yeah. is a different country, yes. Uh, it's an interesting point. When I came to Columbia in 1958, uh, certainly there was no, nothing called Indian studies. I don't think they called it area studies. The only, because there was a China program, Japanese program, and Russian. That was the outside world. Uh, and oh, they and were important because of the godless commies. We had to study about right. them. And Middle East mm -hmm. was also important. Uh -huh. South Asia was not important. It was not on the, the books. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly Indian studies mm -hmm. was not on the books. Uh, so were you invited to teach in, in South Asian studies, or was this just a coincidence? <laughs> There's a double coincidence. Uh, the Middle East Institute dealing with the Middle East, of course, and Islamic things, uh, had thought that Pakistan should be added to the Middle East in some way. Mm -hmm. But there's no chance of getting somebody hired to teach uh -huh. Pakistan. Uh -huh. So they had the happy thought, actually it was Jack Bryson, had the happy thought, get somebody to teach India, could do all that funny area. Right. And I, they, some of them knew who I was. I'd done my work at Columbia. And so the idea was to get somebody who could do a bit and touch on Pakistan as well as India. But the other thing that was important at this time was the development at Columbia. It had long had what was called contemporary civilization, which meant, of course, the Western world. Oh, so but these people must have felt threatened uh, that you were coming in and teaching some other kind well, of civilization. Well, yes, it was the, to bring me in along with the people interested in the Middle East Institute were uh, Ted DeBerry and Jack Barson, who had begun to be interested that ha should other civilizations be added? Should there be recognition that there are other civilizations in the West? And this was a controversy. I mean, the idea was if you're going to teach civilizations, and of course Columbia University has had this great uh, uh, you know, program in civilizations as the basis of its undergraduate curriculum. And uh, it was the basis, so why add <laughs> these funny foreign uh, countries? Right. And wasn't there what Alan Bloom was talking about the closing of the American mind? Is very concerned about Western civilization not being taught properly. Alan Bloom and, is interesting. He wrote this book that every academic mm -hmm. dreams of writing a book mm -hmm. that would sell the way Alan Bloom's <laughs> did. I regret to say I bought it, added to his royalties. <laughs> uh, he was one of the most prominent people denouncing what he called foreign area studies. Our job is to teach students about our own culture. And our own culture meant 
European well, culture. Yeah, European culture. That, I mean, very much our culture. And Alan Bloom said one of the troubles was that we're teaching students relativism. This person he used as an example was a very famous person at Columbia, Margaret Mead. Mm. He referred to her as a sexual adventuress <laughs> who went around the world sampling <laughs> foreign cultures and then coming and teaching students that there was no truth. <laughs> you took what you want. Mm. He said it was all right to learn about foreign cultures, but uh, Mead and her life and her ilk actually suggest that we could learn from foreign cultures. That was the objection of a lot of the people. So the idea that Asian cultures, the Chinese, the India, Middle Eastern, was a part of our own cultural heritage simply didn't enter their minds. It's an interesting point. It didn't enter their mind partly because there were no very few at the undergraduate level. Uh, there's no Indians uh, studying at Columbia's undergraduate at that time. Maybe a few Chinese. No, there was no thought that there were students in our classes. Mm. Nor was there any suggestion that it might be useful to know something about China and India. Uh, so Japan, but, 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 Japan was it, a mm. little different because we had been at war with Japan. So that was... Well, that's what I was going to get at. I mean, then why did it persist? I mean, how did, how did the study of these other cultures uh, develop at all? And, and was it in part for the reason that you just implied, the political ones. I mean, after all, uh, World War II is over. We just fought a war involving uh, Asian countries. We're now uh, responsible for the overseeing some of the, uh, some of the former Ch uh, Japanese as well as European um, uh, territory holdings. And now we're engaged in a new Cold War uh, with the godless commies that included China as well as, uh, uh, as Russia. Uh, and in the third world was kind of caught between. There was a consciousness that we had to know about them to try to lure them on our side. Was this no, no, no. It's an interesting point. Was this political context? No, anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, nobody would have read the books. There were conferences held at that time, precisely. Mm -hmm. One of the very best was held, sponsored by Milton Singer, who was at University of mm -hmm. Chicago, and Ted DeBerry at Columbia. The best one, I think, was on India, where this question... Why do we want our undergraduates to know about countries in India, China, yeah. and so on? The answer they gave would not be acceptable now. Mm. They said in, in their proposal, it would deepen our students' knowledge of their own society to learn about other cultures. I right. think this would not be considered... <laughs> right. a, a and their own, of course, again, meaning European yes. society. And they emphasized mm. that the value of study about China or India was it would give you more sense of the, what your own culture is about, which I think is true. But let's get to a very important point, and that is funding. Oh. Uh, because uh, <laughs> we academics like to pretend that money has no role to play oh, no, in the way things no. develop. But isn't it true that uh, at the time, uh, maybe not in 1958, but shortly after, wasn't the Ford Foundation and then government funds available for the study of other this cultures? This is an interesting point, which many people you suggest academics are very poor, very pure. They don't like to mention money. Right. People like uh, DeBerry at Columbia, Singer at the University of Chicago, uh, wanted to stress the cultural value. Mm. But then there, there was the other people more, and no, the, uh, these people were realistic too, was the idea of the National Defense Language Program. The idea that one reason we well, had to learn something about language was we might be at war with these people. You put me through a graduate school. I studied Hindi, I uh, studied about I India, and, and that was the way I made my money. I got uh, Well, the university was filled with people, mm -hmm. and I had to do a little bit because I, I never got any. I helped spend it. <laughs> right. But uh, see, Hindi was a good example. Mm -hmm. We could argue certainly we might be at war with China, Russia, right. Middle East languages. Right. But India was difficult. Nobody thought we'd ever be at war with India. We didn't do any business with India. But it was part of the third world. Christian, Krishna Menon and Nehru were you know, seeming to be playing footsie with the Soviets. Uh, wasn't there the idea that we had to know about them in order to try to seduce them?